Th thank you very much, uh, Ram, and thank you for having me come speak today. I was somewhat recently named Chief of Surgical Oncology at UCLA, and the same day that that, that announcement came, Raman asked me to come speak at the symposium on benign condition. So I uh, was, w was excited to do that. Uh, you know, I love the pancreas, uh, which by the way means of meat and flesh. So it's really a cool organ um, and uh, happy to talk about acute and chronic pancreatitis. And one other thing, Ollie, all great bands start in a garage. Uh, we'll start with acute pancreatitis. This is a case I did when I <clears throat> first joined the faculty uh, at UCLA. Uh, I was really, really proud of it. It was a patient with necrotizing, infected necrotizing pancreatitis. We did a total pancreatectomy on the patient or just debrided the entire pancreas, outlined it with the string and whatnot. But, uh, you know, it is, it's, a, it's, it's a barbaric approach. And I think what I want to say today, um, and you'll see during the course of the talk, is uh, this is rarely, 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 if ever done anymore, and I can't remember doing one in the last few years, debriding a pancreas at all. Uh, the, the management has, has really changed. So <laughs> if the title of the talk is when to refer to a surgeon, I, I think the answer is probably almost, almost never or very rarely. Um, uh, this is, uh, so the, the procedures that surgeons have in their, in their toolbox, uh, we have in our toolbox, I guess I should say, are uh, open debridement, laparoscopic debridement, retroperitoneal debridements. Uh, you can see the figures here on the top, yet another open debridement that was done many, many years ago. Um, you know, we used to leave the abdomen open and packed and all sorts of stuff, and now we treat these patients with almost no incisions, which is, which is wonderful for them. Um, and then on the bottom there is a retroperitoneal uh, debridement, uh, tre a, a protocol procedure really revolutionized for the most part at University of Washington in Seattle, where they, do, where they did a lot of this before they started treating it uh, endoscopically, but you can see there's just small holes uh, that are made in the patient's back to minimize the risk of wound infections, dehiscences, et cetera. I think this slide is uh, informative. It kind of shows the evolution of treatment of uh, severe acute pancreatitis. It happened in the 80s and the 90s when surgery was still a major uh, part of the therapy. Um, and, but you can see it used to be in the, in, in the 80s, <laughs> I guess when Metallica was getting good, um, people um, rushed patients to the operating room, right? So if you see between 80 and 85 and 86 and 90, uh, surgery in less than 72, uh, in greater than 72 hours was only 50% of patients, right? So most people, or at least half, had surgery early on, and the mortality rate was 39%, really high for severe acute pancreatitis. But uh, during that time, uh, when I was training, it was, you know, uh, the, the early surgery was uh, reduced, and we instead first treated patients, end organ, comor <clears throat> issues, and insufficiencies, and surgery was delayed, and the mortality rate is down to 12%. Yeah, I'm not saying that this is a causal effect. There are many other contributing factors. <clears throat> Excuse me, but... But our approach to the disease improved, and part of that approach was to delay the operation. Uh, there are two main types of pancreatic necrosis. There's sterile pancreatic necrosis, and there's infected pancreatic necrosis. And a point that I want to get across to you is, is infection and acute, severe acute pancreatitis should drive your management. Infection drives the management. So for the most part, sterile pancreatic necrosis, non-operative therapy, or non-interventional therapy may even be best. Uh, but you need to be careful to monitoring for infection and only operate for complications or intervene for complications or in patients who uh, fail, fail to progress. This is a, a question that I have. I thought they were going to switch the, the, the um, program, but nonetheless. So 63-year-old gentleman with acute pancreatitis who's been in the hospital for two weeks, heart rate tachycardic, uh, there's the blood pressure, white count 33,000, Serum amylase at 210. This new CT scan is available for review. And here's the CT scan that you, that, that you get on this patient. And the question is, is, what's the next step to address these findings? Is IV antibiotics, urgent surgical exploration, endoscopic ultrasound guided drainage, percutaneous drainage, FNA, gram stain, and culture. I don't know if you have your handheld things. Right 
So IV antibiotics uh, wins out. Endoscopic ultrasound guided drainage uh, is in third. And um, uh, second place was FNA uh, gram stain um, of the, the fluid. Um, I'd argue that the best answer is per percutaneous drainage or even potentially endoscopic ultrasound guided drainage. If you remember looking back, this patient um, has infected pancreatic necrosis, right? So there's, there's air, there's gas bubbles that are there. Uh, by definition, this is, this is air as long as it hasn't been intervened on or gas from, from bacteria or gas producing bacteria. So you already know that this is infected. Uh, and at, at, it should be intervened on. And the best way to initially intervene on this patient is, as I just showed you, is not, not necessarily a surgical debridement, right? So later surgery, better. Uh, but percutaneous drainage uh, and or endoscopic uh, guided, guided drainage. What, the way that we would approach this patient now, I would say, at UCLA, which, which we'll go over, is probably similar to the Virginia Mason protocol, where a percutaneous drain is put in and then we rush the patient up to the endoscopic suite uh, where um, a, a transgastric uh, drainage is, is performed. Um, so I put this in your syllabus uh, too. I'd pay attention to the top of it. Again, the point to drive home here is infectin drives your management, infection drives your management. At the top, uh, pancreatic necrosis, if there's a suspicion, suspic suspicion of infection, right? So there's no air bubbles or gas bubbles on there, which, which confirm that it is infected, right? So if it just looks like there's a lot of necrosis or there's a suspicion of infection, uh, the best thing to do for that is to get an FNA. Don't put a drain in. Don't do anything uh, other than just get, get, get an FNA, to get a, F, a gram stain in culture. Um, to, to, to confirm that there is or is not an infection there, right? Because if there's not and there's sterile necrosis, best management for this patient may be no intervention and don't infect it. Um, but, but if there's a suspicion, get, get an FNA. And if, in fact, that shows that there's an infection, uh, then, then the next step would be to, to do either a percutaneous drainage or endoscopic uh, mediated uh, uh, debridement uh, and, and or drainage. Um, so uh, again, just get an FNA, do the least invasive thing possible, the, least, the thing that's least possible to cause a super infection of that necrosum. Uh, but if there's air f bubbles that are there, you can assume uh, that, it, that it is infected and it needs to be intervened on if the patient uh, uh, symptomatology merits it. This is, uh, was a transformative paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published in 2010. Um, and it really changed our management to patients with uh, severe acute necrotizing pancreatitis, right? Prospective trial, that's the way I guess you get your stuff into the New England Journal of Medicine, unlike the 80s where case reports were published, according to Dr. Sederat. Um, so do a, a, they compared open necrosectomy versus a percutaneous drainage and minimally invasive uh, necrosectomy. And... Um, uh, of the patients in that latter group, the perk drainage and the minimally invasive necrosectomy group, 35% or a third were treated with percutaneous drainage alone. Uh, and organ failure and, uh, uh, was much lower in the perk drain pa patients who uh, potentially had the minimally invasive necrosectomy, lower hernias, et cetera, et cetera. So these patients just did better, right? So this is, was referred to the step-up approach, step-up approach, and it was the, the, the Panther study, which, which you know, <laughs> was objective evidence to tell the surgeons to, to, to hold off for a little bit. This was another, I think, transformative study that was published in JAMA. Prospective trial, uh, endoscopic transgastric versus surgical necrosectomy for infected pancre necrotizing pancreatitis. They randomized 22 patients. And the uh, early term results, uh, the endoscopic necrosectomy did better, right, than the, than the surgical necrosectomy. So post-procedural cytokine levels were lower. Uh, less organ uh, failure, pancreatic fistulae were, were, were less, um, uh, which is, can be a problem, the pancreatic cutaneous fistula after, after this. So, you know, another transformative study. So now we went from doing early surgery to perk drainage and, and laparoscopic necrosectomy, a step-up approach to potentially even not uh, doing anything uh, tr transcutaneous or, or surgically uh, and, and to doing it endoscopically. Um, uh, so two, two other papers that I think are, are also very informative that are, that are in your syllabus, and I, I'm, <laughs> they must be informative if you have a surgeon here who's, who's quoting the GI endoscopy lecture. Um, I, I, re I really like them, and you know, I've, I've, I've even read them both. Um, and you know, they've, they've um, <laughs> strongly guided how we take care of our patients now. So this is, this is those Virginia Mason 
um, uh, protocols that they've developed uh, for necrotizing patients with necrotizing pancreatitis, acute necrotizing pancreatitis, 117 patients they've had in their experience now, and they've never operated on any of them, none of them. So their protocol is to put in a percutaneous drain, then uh, rush the patient up to the endoscopy suite, um, where anesthesia is willing and waiting, apparently, uh, to do an endoscopic drain. They call this a dual modality drainage. Again, no patients required necrosectomy, none. And all patients completing treatment, none of them, none of them developed a pancreatic cutaneous fistula. So, I mean, there's some nuances of their protocol that you can, that you can read about, but this is a, this is a major a accomplishment uh, in something that uh, has really transformed the way that I think as a surgeon about how to treat this disease. Okay, chronic pancreatitis. We're going to switch gears just, just a little bit. Uh, chronic pancreatitis, a very complex uh, disease uh, to, to treat uh, surgically. Um, the, the tools that we have in our toolbox um, are uh, decompression or, or drainage procedures, Pusteau procedure, Fry procedure, Beggar procedures, uh, or resections, Whipple, distal, total pancreatectomy, autoilet transplant, child operations, Duval operations. I myself have never done a child procedure, Duval procedure, or beggar procedure. They're virtually never done uh, in, in the United States, but I do do Fry procedures quite frequently. And you can see there on the right, that's an example of a Fry procedure where uh, the uh, pancreatic duct has been filleted open and we core out the head of the pancreas um, uh, for patients with large duct chronic pancreatitis. So, so what do we think about when we're trying to decide the surgery or the specific operation technique that we perform on patients with chronic pancreatitis? So uh, duct diameter and head size determine the, the operation, right? So if, for, for patients in whom we perform a drainage procedure or fry procedure, I uh, like to look for a large head, so transverse diameter greater than three and a half centimeters. Uh, the duct uh, at least seven millimeters in the body, which is a dilated duct, right? And so um, uh, these patients uh, do uh, almost as well uh, or as well as those uh, who you may want to do a, a Whipple on, right? So their effective long-term pain relief is, is short-term and long-term pain relief uh, are, are good. But again, it's a drainage operation for patients who have uh, dilated uh, pancreatic ducts and enlarged pancreatic head. Small duct disease, our, our only uh, uh, tool really is a, a Whipple, and that's done for because the head of the gland is thought to be the pacemaker. Uh, or a total pancreatectomy um, with potentially with autoilet uh, transplantation, uh, which we've had some experience with uh, at, UC, at UC, UCLA. We, we do have a program in that. What about endotherapy? I know the title of this talk or the subject is, is when to refer a patient to surgery. Um, the alternative option for patients with uh, chronic pancreatitis or large duct chronic pancreatitis uh, is, is endotherapy uh, versus surgery. I think if we're going to go down the road of endotherapy, which I think is a reasonable thing to do at the beginning, but I think that we should have a somewhat low-ish threshold uh, to convert for surgery once endotherapy is shown to not work. But, but the first thing to do, as Ali talked about uh, last, is to, is to rule out pancreatic cancer, right? So um, I think a, a good endoscopic ultrasound, potentially even biopsy of the pancreas, is important to make sure that there's no pancreatic cancer. Some of these pa patients have... Um, familial chronic pancreatitis, which is a 40% lifetime risk, right? So pretty high, so rule out cancer first. Indications for endotherapy, at least from my perspective, are main duct stricture, or pancreatic duct stones. Um, strictures are managed, uh, you can probably tell me better than this, with dilatation and pancreatic duct stent placement. But I'd say the most of the literature that I've read in, in my perspective is about a third um, uh, resolve, um, but two-thirds, uh, uh, and two-thirds, patients have pain improvement, but pain often returns after the stent is removed, about two months or so after the stent is removed. Uh, so, you know, I, I, what, I, what, what I said is, is, you know, I think we need to have a somewhat reasonable uh, threshold on uh, when uh, stenting uh, is, is, is enough and it's time to perform a potentially or a more durable drainage procedure. I think stones are much more difficult than strictures to, to, to get out and to, and to take care of. They obviously require as well, um, potentially multiple procedures. They adhere to the duct wall. Sometimes I can't even rip these suckers out during, during an operation. It's very, very, very difficult to do. We just did a case last week or the week before um, that uh, 
the stone was right past the ampulla. Raman tried to get it out. I couldn't do so. And we, we, we had an incredibly difficult time getting it out during the operation. We did a fry procedure on the patient. This was another, I think, a very important study, again, in the GI literature, I think it was a Dutch group, um, where they did a prospective randomized trial where they looked at endotherapy versus surgery for patients with a cr chronic pancreatitis or large duct chronic pancreatitis. Um, they had five-year follow-up, so good durable follow-up. Uh, um, and some, some points are 50% of patients who were treated with endotherapy ultimately crossed over to the surgery arm. Surgery group had less hospitalizations and less repeat procedures and better long-term pain relief than the patients with endotherapy. But an important point here is, is there was a subgroup of patients who did well and all they needed was the endotherapy uh, treatment. So I do think it's a okay, good, acceptable, appropriate, reasonable, potentially even better than surgery way to, way to start the treatment uh, sequence for these patients. But again, uh, uh, don't be afraid to cross over to the surgery group. And I would recommend that it be done at a specialized center because there's many ways to skin this cat in terms of you know, fry procedures, Whipple procedures, total pancreatectomies, autoimmune, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, auto islet transplants. What's the timing of surgery? Well, the timing of surgery is controversial. A bottom line of this for patients with chronic pancreatitis, bottom line, pain is the primary determinant of intervention. That should be the driving factor. Infection for acute pancreatitis, uh, but pain for chronic pancreatitis. Uh, there has been a debate for many years about whether or not surgery can be, or, or, or treatment or drainage of patients with large duct chronic pancreatitis is prophylactic. I don't think it's convincing at all. Um, there's, uh, you know, some suggestion that it may prevent progressive disease or reduces long-term uh, opioid use, uh, but for, for the most part, um, you know, I could argue in the counter that it's also been shown that those patients who have had a prior pusto procedure who then go for auto islet transplant, that there's less islets that are harvested in patients who have had a previous pusto procedure. So I don't think that prophylaxis is really so much on the table. But, but, but really, pain, pain, pain is the primary determinant of, of timing uh, and management of these patients. So uh, just to, to summarize at the end here, uh, first, acute pancreatitis, infection drives management. Infection drives management. There's a small subgroup of patients in, who have sterile uh, necrosis who fail to progress and you, you, you require an, an intervention, right? So... But, but let them fail first. The more time you get under your belt, it seems, the better. Um, step up approach, that, that uh, paper from the New England Journal of Medicine that I showed you, perk drain and minimally invasive surgery uh, did better than, than the initial open, open approach. Endoscopic necrosectomy in the JAMA uh, paper did better than even the minimally invasive surgery. So um, these are all uh, potentially better uh, approaches to managing these patients. We really have adopted and like the dual modality drainage. Uh, the, 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 the difference with there is, is that the Virginia Mason Group never does endoscopic necrosectomies. They at least claim that, but we've, uh, we, we, we still do do endoscopic necrosectomies. I, I think the patients get, get better quicker uh, when it's done, and we, we haven't seen any issues or complications uh, with them. Surgical debridement, that, that total pancreas that I showed you, like we kind of peeled the orange in one peel, you know, it, uh, it's really used uh, less frequently. And I can't remember doing it in the, in the last few years. We really don't do it much anymore. A chronic pancreatitis, again, pain drives management, uh, not, not prophylactic intervention. So really have the, the, the patient symptomatology or pain drive your management. Large duct disease, um, I think uh, there's an argument that surgery is a superior to endoscopic therapy. It's, it's more durable, but there's a subset of patients who do well with endoscopic therapy. So I think it's reasonable to start with that approach. But again, don't be afraid to cross over uh, if you think the patient is not um, doing particularly well, even with repeated procedures. And well, that's the last thing. Of course, I'm a surgeon, right? So low threshold for surgical referral. Um, but, you know, we approach this in a multidisciplinary fashion. Uh, so we, we make collaborative joint decisions together. And I think that's the best way to do that, particularly for these patients. So I'm right on time. Um, and th uh, again, thank you very much for, for, for having me today.